Hello, everyone, and welcome to BFG's webinar series. My name is Cody Niedermeyer, and I am an associate slash webinar host now uh, as of this year. And today we're going to be talking about buying a house. For those of you that are new to the webinar series, we've been doing this for all of 2021 so far, and it's been an absolute joy. We've received great feedback, and we've been able to put a little bit more information into the world that you know, people have been able to take and implement into their lives. So we're going to continue doing these. And today we have Lena Nebel, who is a principal at BFG with 20 years of experience in the industry and one of my favorite advisors in the office. So welcome back, Lena. Thanks, Carity. I'm excited to be here again. Nice. So today we get to talk about a lot of people's favorite topics. And one of the topics that a lot of people have questions on is buying a house. And there's so many different ways we could go about this and we could have a webinar series for an entire year on it. And sure. we're going to, we're going to try to break it down and uh, kind of hit all the basics. And then if anybody has any questions along the way, just please type those into the comment box and we are going to try to address those at the end. And if we don't get to those questions, um, you'll see a little tab at the end with a QR code. And if you're on your phone, um, if you just respond to the email that notified you about this webinar, uh, we'll be able to help answer any questions or set up a consultation with one of our advisors for free to, uh, you know, maybe steer you in the right direction. So without further ado, um, I believe we're going to get started with everyone's favorite disclosure slide that has to be on here. So there's that. Mm -hmm. And now the idea of buying a house, Lena, I want to buy a house. Where do I even begin? Mm, great question. Um, I think that you you first have to look at is it a good idea to even buy a house, okay. right? Um, so a lot of people can say, you know, I want to get out of my apartment or I want to get out of my parents' mm -hmm. house, and now I let's buy a house. Um, I think first thinking about okay, is it is it a good idea, you know, and starting with the financials of that person's individual situation. And for some people, you know, renting could be the best course of action, both you know, short term and long term, and you know, I think for purposes of this conversation and, and um, the, the varying topics that we're going to talk about, I think it's important to, um, to mention that everything we're talking about can relate to if this is your first house or if this is your 10th house, right? All of the, right. the, the things to think about, the concepts are going to apply in either situation. Wow. All right. Well, figuring out if it's a good idea, I feel like is always a good starting point. But um. What do you have to say to those people that think of, you know, maybe it is their first house and they see it as that investment? Um, where kind of does their ideology start in that process of being, hey, I want to get this house and possibly rent it out later, or, you know, this is my first starter home? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I mean, we we have a lot of clients who may ask the question, you know, is buying buying a house a good investment? Is it something that I should add into our uh, you know to our tangible assets into the portfolio? And I know we're primarily talking about primary residences, personal residences for purposes of the conversation, but I think we can think about um, a house as real estate because that's what it is. So the question is really, is real estate a good investment? And for a lot of people, it's not. You know, They may not have a lot of liquidity. They may be behind in their financial goals or just kind of struggling with cash flow. So purchasing a property that could be illiquid um, may not be the, the best course of action. Um, so just like stocks or bonds, real estate is a type of asset that can diversify your portfolio. And there are real estate agents who specialize in rental properties and investment properties. And so um, meeting up with one of them to determine the cash flow of a property and to understand if that could be a good investment, I think is a fantastic idea for those individuals that can take that risk and that, that have that liquidity. Um, but if it's your house, then I would say no. It's it's not a for the most part it's not a good investment to look at it that way. You know you don't want to think about your primary residence as something that's going to generate retirement income for you, or that you plan on selling it and using all that equity to fund education goals because that may be the year where the real estate market takes a hit, right? So just like yeah. stocks and bonds, you know real estate has risk as well. I mean, you bring up the idea of, you know, talking to a professional when you're trying to evaluate these things based on your goals. Um, would you also say that talking to them is the best idea when determining when is the best time to actually purchase a home? Because, I mean, with, as you know, interest rates where they are 
and the housing market, like a lot of people are asking, is now the time to buy or should I wait or different things like that? Yeah, I think that, you know, even though there could be a time period that's the best time to buy a house, yeah. you may not be financially ready to buy a house, right? Mm -hmm. And I think if we ask all of our real estate friends, is now a good time to buy a house? I would pretty certain guarantee that they'll say 100% of the time, now is the best time to buy a house, right? <laughs> yeah. um, and again, I always, I always talk about it, it comes down to that person's individual situation. And so when you think about just looking at the numbers and, and you know, in the state of Maryland, where we're based, um, the average monthly rental, um, the, the rental market in an apartment is $2,000 a month. So if you ended up purchasing a property for, let's just say 350,000 and you financed it for 30 years at three and a half percent, that mortgage payment's going to be around 1,500 a month. Now that gives you some wiggle room to pay for property taxes, paying for insurance, um, and then of course utilities and other things. So if you just look at it from a dollar standpoint, and if you're renting, yeah, your money could be put into something um, better for you financially mm -hmm. long term. So you know, try not to time it from the best time on buying a house yeah. if this is your home. Um, that's one answer, but is now the best time to buy a house from an investment property is really going to be dependent on, again, what your financial goals are, how mm -hmm. quickly you want to flip that house. Are you improving it and then selling it at a, at a greater rate? Or are you just planning on generating income from that property? So when meeting with a real estate agent, um, many real estate agents have two types of, spe you know, have different types of specialties. So you could have the, the one who is going to be more focused on primary residences and then one that could be investment properties. Um, you know, when I just kind of take a look back at my experience in home buying, you know, my, my husband and I, our, our first house was a townhome because we wanted to get out of the apartment, right? We were in that situation to where we saw what we were spending in an apartment versus how that money could be applied to a house. Well, yeah. in the house that we are now, which is our third home, our motivation was family related. You know, our family was growing. We wanted more space. We were con we were concerned about school districts. Um, we wanted that forever home. So the motivation changed for us on you know first house versus now, and that's going to be the same thing for many people. So you don't want to feel rushed. That oh my gosh, interest rates are really low. I got to jump in on it, and then you're not ready to afford that type of house either trying to avoid the emotional decision of I want it so I'm going to go get it but you bring up sure. also the classic point of every answer is kind of it, it depends so. absolutely you know I think that it, and in our industry right there's not um, mm -hmm. one size fits all and that's what makes it exciting because people's situations are different you know with the, yeah. um, a lot of our coworkers, you know they they're renting they're in process of mm -hmm. saving to to buy a house some people are building a house some people are going to rent for a long time some people are going to end up buying you know maybe a single family home whereas again in my situation many years ago it was kind of a stage right you went from mm -hmm. a town home to maybe a single family to the forever yeah. now people are jumping right into that forever home because of where rates are and where valuations mm -hmm. are and people's financial situations um, are a lot different too, you know, uh, which I know we'll, we'll talk about in how to purchase the property and finance it. But you're right, Cody, every situation is going to be different. Yeah, that's almost a bad word in the industry is guarantee or the idea of a blanket statement that one size fits all for everybody. Right. But now we've we've worked our way. We decided, you know, we're ready to move forward. We've identified our goals, whether it's an investment or a primary residence. And now's the time that we are buying a house. Mm -hmm. Where do we even begin? So your stress level is going to probably spike during this process. Yeah. Um, you're going to be uh, attached to your phone with a, a flurry <laughs> of emails that are going to be coming through. Um, yeah. So the first step, quite honestly, is you know, you're going to be meeting with the lender. The lender is going to walk you through what you are pre-approved for. Yeah. So what you think you can afford could be dramatically different than what the lender is comfortable in having you borrow. Um, especially if you are self-employed, the underwriting requirements are completely different too from an income standpoint. Um, when I bought, uh, when we bought our first house, those were during the days where what was called no documentation loans. So mm -hmm. you didn't even have to show how you were making money. 
you just told them that you were making money. And of course, that's what caused many issues within the real estate environment. And so there's, wow. uh, it's gotten much tighter and stricter in mm -hmm. what you can do and everything. Um, but um, what you're going to be doing is you're going to be meeting with the lender. That's really going to be the first step um, as you, you know, find that home and everything to make sure that you're looking at in the right price range. So the right. lender is going to just kind of look at your income, your debt, and they're going to calculate what's called a debt to income ratio. So the debt to income ratio is all of your monthly debts divided by your gross income. And this is a way that lenders measure how risky you are. Should they be loaning you money? You know, um, And so once they get what that number is, let's say you qualify for $400,000, um, that's where you can kind of start your, your home search and everything on that standpoint. Um, but you may disagree with what the lender um, thinks that you can afford. And that house, let's say 400,000, that may not be the house that has everything that you want. And so you may have to go above your price range, mm -hmm. which means you have to think about how you're bringing more money to the table to purchase that, that higher rate. Um, okay. Like I said, once you get pre-approved and you, you find that house, you then put in your offer. And that's where the real estate agent is extremely helpful through that process because yeah. they're going to be drawing up the contract. They're going to be laying out the terms of your offer. And there's a lot of details in that offer, um, how you're paying for it, um, if there's certain things that the seller um, would like to have included that you don't want to, um, the timing of settlement, you know, they may want to be able to settle right away and you may not be able to settle. Um, you may have to sell your house first before you can purchase that house. Uh, and you may disagree on the price. So there's a lot of negotiating back and forth. And in um, today's world right now, um, it really is a seller's market, right? People are yes. putting their house on the market and they are getting a lot of contracts over lists. So there used to be what was called escalation clauses built into contracts. And people now, they're just saying, give me your best offer. Yeah, so wow. this is an environment where um, sellers are uh, being able to, to, to do really well during, during this time period. So again, you, the real estate agent is going to work with you and going back and forth with the seller and um, mm -hmm. the seller's representation. And then once a contract is put in place, um, again, that's when more fun happens because then you get to deal with the home inspections. And this tends to be more stressful for the seller than the buyer because they're going yep. through their house and they are inspecting everything about their house, right? The appliances, yes. the roof, you know, what has been covered up by paint and carpet? Um, what are things that you, the original um, buyer, the owner never knew about? All that stuff's going to come up. And so yep. the inspection, they're going to say, hey, you need to fix all of these things. And the seller is either going to agree or not. Um, so again, more negotiations are going to happen on right. what you want to have fixed or not. Um, again, just personal example, when we purchased our townhouse, uh, the deck was horrible, not safe at all. And so instead of them just fixing it, they threw in extra money towards mm -hmm. our closing costs to kind of offset that deck. So there's okay. different ways in how you can negotiate that home inspection. Um, and again, the, the home inspection, there could be multiple inspections depending on how old the home is. There's mm -hmm. different areas that they need to inspect. Um, and if there are, um, uh, let's say, a pool or other pieces of property um, associated to that house. So if there's, let's say, detached garages and everything mm -hmm. else, those are going to be maybe multiple inspections that need. So um, once that has happened, and again, you guys have all agreed to everything, then you get to set the date for closing and go through the fun process of signing over 100 pages that nobody knows what they're actually uh, reading. So mm -hmm. um, that was one thing that we've seen hasn't really changed much since COVID is mm -hmm. you're still signing all of those documents, right? It could be DocuSign, okay. um, yeah. but you're still going through 100 pages of documents. Um, you know, we always encourage people to talk with the realtor the title agent, the lender to discuss all the details about it, because you need to know what you're signing off on, especially as it relates to the terms of your loan. If yeah. you can prepay it, um, what happens if you're late, you know, kind of all of those things. So it is it is important to, to go through that. So from start to finish, you know, obviously one of the areas that you're going to be focusing on the most is obviously how are you going to pay for it, right? We kind of talked about buying the house and everything um, and what happens from 
pre-approval all the way to closing, but yeah. at some point we have to pay for it. Yeah. And I mean, case in point, you're kind of leading into my next question for you was the idea of putting down 20%. It's kind of been a rule of thumb for a long time in mm -hmm. order to avoid something called PMI that I'm sure you're going to explain. But um, is is putting down the 20% still the best idea or does it go back to our idea of it depends? I think I can just say it depends for everything, right? That yeah. can be my, my blanket statement, right? Uh, you know, putting down 20% in a perfect world would be great, right? To yeah. be able to have that amount, avoid um, PMI, and, and just so that everybody's aware, um, PMI is, is private mortgage insurance. Um, mm -hmm. And this basically protects the lender in the event that you stop paying the mortgage. So if you don't put 20% down, you then have this extra payment associated to your mortgage. Mm -hmm. So when the lender is calculating uh, debt to income ratio, they have to factor in that additional payment that you're going to have as well. And a lot of people assume that once you've established 20% equity in the house, PMI automatically goes away. And that's not the case. It's up to the lender and basically those rules in, that, uh, in your closing documents that's going to determine when PMI goes away. So for some people, they actually have to refinance to show that there is that 20% equity to then get out of the PMI and there could be additional costs. Um, for other lenders, they may say, we don't look at it until you're seven years into the mortgage. So it's important to understand when does that PMI go away? And for some lenders, that PMI could be very expensive and for others, it may be manageable. So it would be okay not putting the 20% down because the PMI payment makes sense. Um, there are also lenders who mm -hmm. don't require 20%, certain credit yeah. unions that will say, even not for first time home buyers, they just, you know, a special relationship that you have with that credit union, um, being a customer there, they have rates. Now the rates may be a little bit higher. So you yeah. have to justify to say, okay, do I want to give up some of my liquidity to pull down that mortgage payment? And mm -hmm. um, in our situation, we did not put 20% down. We actually used a lender that didn't require it, so I didn't have PMI. And the reason that we wanted to keep some of our the, the proceeds from the house that we sold on the sidelines was because we had projects that we wanted to do in the house. And after we weighed the cost of getting rid of uh, or putting down that 20% and getting rid of our liquidity versus using that money and then improving the equity within our house by doing different improvements, we just thought in our situation, that made the most sense. Um, but for some people, they can't afford to put the 20% down. They need to have some of that liquidity. So to start, yes, it would be great to kind of plan for that 20% down. Mm -hmm. um, but with interest rates where they are right now, money is so cheap. So it may not be advisable to sink a lot of cash into the house right away. It really comes down to what the lender is offering you. And um, if you have to put that 20% down, uh, and it may be part of just to try to keep your mortgage payment down as well. Yeah, and that's doing kind of the research beforehand on what you can afford each month and building that into your ratio that you're building. But um, right. if you're trying to come up with this 20% or maybe even reach the 5% that your goal is, is there any opportunity, you know, maybe for a parent or somebody else to contribute or if they're willing to? Yeah, absolutely. You know, gifting from parents mm -hmm. uh, or grandparents or whoever it may be, uh, is extremely common. Um, okay. It's important to understand for both parties, it's not a taxable event, but there are certain rules you have to follow. There are mm -hmm. uh, gifting lender, uh, sorry, gifting letters that the lender will need to see to make sure um, that it truly is a gift. If it's actually a loan, again, that's going to be a payment that's going to increase that debt to income ratio as well that may push you out of the ballpark on what you're trying to afford. So. Um, gifting is very common and it just depends on how much they're giving. And of course, if behind the scenes, if there's any um, types of rules attached to that from, from the parent's standpoint. But I know when my husband and I got engaged, my parents um, basically said they can either give us money towards a wedding or give us money towards our first house purchase. And we chose the house purchase, which made us more cost conscious in our um, in our wedding decisions. And I'm not sure if I shared that story or not during our uh, our last mm -hmm. webinar um, about marriage and everything. But you can see how these topics kind of go hand in hand and having these yeah. financial conversations. So gifting, again, 
very popular. Um, there's no issues with that. You just have to make sure that you're following the rules as it relates to the lender. The lender's going to want to see the gift letter. They're going to want to see that the money is in the bank account. So there may be some additional questions that are uh, needing to be answered if somebody is going to um, use the gifting. And, and lastly, um, if a parent decides to do some type of gifting for the down payment, they are not co-signers. It is a gift. Good so point. they are releasing that money. They have no rights to that equity. They have no rights to get that money back because it is not a loan and they are not on the deed in any way. Yeah, no, that's that's a very good point that I think was uh, actually see as a question that somebody already had before we even got to it. So thank you for addressing that. Um, I think there are a few, just two or three terms that I think are very important to know when you're getting into the process, maybe like a little glossary of sorts. Mm -hmm. But um, could you start off by explaining exactly what is escrow? Sure, sure. Um, so by definition, escrow is just a, it's a legal agreement in which a third party controls money until two other parties are involved in a transaction. And as it relates okay. to a mortgage um, it, for, for escrowing, you know, the lender deposits the escrow portion of your mortgage payment into an account, and then they pay insurance premiums and real estate taxes. Mm -hmm. So when you're looking at your mortgage payment, you're going to have principal and interest, and then you may have an escrow payment. And that escrow payment covers property taxes and covers um, like your homeowner's insurance. The benefit in doing that is that it allows you to budget that payment so that you don't have to come up with thousands of dollars every six months. And of course, depending yeah. on the county that you live in, um, it could be pretty substantial. So uh, coming back to one of our earlier conversations on you know, doing your research and finding out what you can qualify for, a $400,000 house in, let's say, Howard County versus mm -hmm. a $400,000 house in Hartford County is going to have a different size house, and it's also going to yeah. have different property taxes. So for some people, they may not be able to afford property taxes in certain counties because they're just too expensive. Um, same yeah. thing with, uh, you know, when, when, when an individual is retiring and they're looking to go into different types of communities, you know, another, another thing that can be escrowed could be the condo fee. And so in the condo mm -hmm. fee can be pretty expensive in some of these retirement communities and have to be factored into their, uh, their monthly payments. Yeah. But um, I'd say 99% of the time people escrow, it just makes life easier. And for some lenders, they require it. Yeah. And I know personally, I have the automation set up that you don't even think about it. It's just one sum that comes out and kind of covers everything. And we've talked about automation many of times in previous webinars of, you know, don't see it, it gets done for you. And it's, uh, it kind of simplifies your world. So escrow is a part of that. But right. our next definition is just titling and the idea of titling, which actually kind of goes back to our previous webinar on right. getting married as well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, titling is extremely important when two people are purchasing the property, e even if they're married. Um, and the reason that I say that is because you can have a joint ownership on a property, but there's only one type of joint ownership that is just specific to married couples, which is joint tenants by entirety. Um, so when you're looking at all the different ways that you can own a property uh, together, you really wanna focus on that titling. Um, Brothers and sisters may own properties because they're they're buying out their parents' house or a parent had passed away and they're now buying it from each other. Um, a boyfriend, girlfriend, partners, they can go in and purchase a property together. And um, you know, one of the things you and I uh, discussed during that webinar was what if two people, you know, they're dating and they decide to purchase a property together, but only one person is on that loan. Okay. And that could be yeah. because of credit scores, financial strength, et cetera, the other party is participating financially, but they're not legally entitled to that property and they're not liable for that property. Well, what if those two individuals break up, right? So you want to make sure that you have some legal documentation put together um, if only one person is going to be on the title, but two people are going to be uh, contributing into that, into that property. And just, um, you know, Cody, in your situation, you know, mm -hmm. you have a your own property and one day when yeah. you get married and, and if you guys decide to keep that property, you may have her come on that property as well. Yeah. And so it is important to, to look at the titling. A lot of those things get overlooked. Um, 
just again being biased as a uh, as a certified financial planner we take a deep dive into mm -hmm. how people title any of their assets including real estate so we want to make sure that if something should happen to that individual it's passing the way that it should be yeah and making sure it's lined up kind of with everything else going on in their world when it comes to the estate planning side Correct. of it and um just everything with cost basis and all the fun stuff that as cfp professionals uh, our advisors and hopefully me at some point um, will be able to identify for clients and help them moving forward. Uh, the last one hits kind of close to home to me. And as you know, for many reasons, and I'm sure you'll call me out and I'll have to give an example or two, but the difference in the idea of having a home warranty, because I think a lot of people mix up just home insurance with their home warranty. So what exactly is a home warranty? Yeah, um, you're right. You know, you and I both have had too many experiences with a home warranty and we're seeing the the benefits of oh, having that absolutely. in place. Absolutely. Um, so I, I always recommend somebody get a home warranty when they purchase a, a new home. And when I say new home, I don't mean brand new they just built, but new yeah. for that for that buyer. So whether it was just built or 40 years old, get a warranty. You do not yeah. know what may happen over the next few months or over the course of the mm -hmm. year. And typically um, the seller usually pays the first year's premium. That's something you can negotiate within mm -hmm. that contract. And then it's up to you to continue that warranty, but something always happens, right? It's either Absolutely. electricity, you know, there's an electrician, there's mm -hmm. um, plumbing issues, appliance issues, something always happens. So, you know, we always have those stories or nightmares, depending on how we look at this. Yeah. Um, and so, having the warranty can help to plan for unforeseen expenses. And if you decide that you don't want that warranty, that you don't think not much is going to happen, save money because you will have unplanned um, expenses that are going to happen. And it's also important to understand the terms of that warranty. Um, mm -hmm. you know, we had an issue to where our refrigerator, um, it just stopped working. So yeah. called the warranty, they came out, they tried to fix mm -hmm. it. It got fixed for maybe a day or two, and then we had the issue again. Very long story short, part of the rules of the warranty, they had to come out six times before they would officially replace that refrigerator. That was something that we did not know because it was different with each appliance. And okay. so they had to waste their time. We had, of course, waste our time, which was always between the hours of you know nine and three, and then they didn't show up, of course, until four. Mm -hmm. um, Usually how it but works. that was that was the rules of of the warranty. They had to make six attempts before they could officially fix it. So you want to make sure that you understand the rules of the warranty, what's covered, what's not. Um, I'm out in the country, so some of our appliances they're not covered, or they may only be covered for one year or two year, whereas mm -hmm. other things are more normal. So again, understanding what you're actually purchasing as well. Yeah, I know personally when I was going through the process of buying my home, you know, I. The thought I was extremely educated, but working with an agent that was educated and everything going on, he was like, oh, no, no, we, we're we going to get this warranty and it's going to be a part of closing for the sellers. And I trusted him. And then he went through the entire process with me. So, you know, working with the right people that really provide you with the information that you don't think of like this warranty. Um, I know it saved my butt a few times and uh, a lot of headaches along the way. So I think it's extremely important. Yeah, and you even had a home inspection that was done mm -hmm. and you still had to use the warranty because something came up. It yep. just it always happens. Um even our colleague who, you know, built a brand new house and everything, you would mm -hmm. think that everything is going to work smoothly. It doesn't. There's always something that can go yep. wrong and everything. So, um yeah, always want to pay attention to those things. Kind of just plan for the worst and Yeah, be prepared for that and everything else will follow through. But uh that actually completely leads us into, you know, we finally bought the home and mm -hmm. you've already touched on it. Um, and I think you just want to keep kind of reiterating it. Um, the idea of unexpected expenses that you just don't think about that have to do with the idea of, you know, maybe things going wrong in the house or the idea of, oh, I got my dream home. Well, now I got to furnish it. I need, I need a, I need a couch. I need a TV. And just, there's so many different things that go into it. Oh, sure. And, you know, if you're in a bachelor pad, I think you can do without, you know, the couch, just get the chair and the TV. And if of course you're in a, uh, you know, you got the family, well, you're going to need everything. Right. Um, but you know, you bought the house, you got to move everything. 
So mm -hmm. let's factor in moving costs. Um, mm -hmm. I used to be of the mindset, let me get all my friends, I'll pay them with pizza and beer and they can move all of my stuff. We're past that point now to where we're hiring a moving truck. So yeah. let's budget in what the costs are of, of moving. You know, some sometimes it's worth the money to not have the stress and the hassle of dealing with you know the actual moving of, of all of your furniture and and Cody when you get to your next house you're going to be moving more stuff because you've yeah. accumulated more stuff right um, yep. and then you'll be able to fill that house and and I remember when we moved into um, our second house I had all this cabinet space and I thought I'm never going to fill this cabinet space I mean I filled it within months so yeah. there's there's going to be additional expenses um, that you're going to have and you know window treatments curtains mm -hmm. carpeting you know you may want to repaint and, and do all those things so um, when thinking about putting money down on the house think about what is everything that you're going to need to purchase to make that house you know your home mm -hmm. uh, but of course there are all of the unexpected expenses that have happened um, yeah. you know we've been in our house for six years last week i had two lights that just fell out of our ceiling in our kitchen for no apparent mm -hmm. reason things I guess got old and nice. had to get the electrician out and look at um, all the components and everything but those are things that you just don't plan for um, a few years ago we had a faulty toilet that actually caused major flood damage that um, forced us to be in temporary housing for six months while our house was oh, being wow. rebuilt not something I planned for but that's why I had homeowners insurance it was a significant claim that the homeowners insurance company paid so when you think about expenses that you can cover, those emergencies that you can cover through cash flow or through bank reserves, think about all the things you can't cover financially. Yeah. That's why you need to make sure that your homeowner's coverage is covering those items, that it's replacing the items that you had. And I could probably have a whole webinar on that topic and that experience and what we learned from it and mm -hmm. how to do things differently and what to keep track of. Um, but again, you you don't know what may happen in your house and to plan for that. So you're always going to have unexpected costs. So you want to make sure that, again, you you come up with um, with the number and you also look at your homeowner's insurance and making sure that you're uh, that you're adequately covered. And those are just unex unexpected expenses. What about like the things that you're expecting? Right. You know, just yep. utilities, um, you know whether you want to get you know some ceiling fans or you're going to do closet organization i mean there's so many things that you're going to want to continue to improve on your property um you know i my husband and i always joke about it because every few months we we literally walk around our house writing down mm -hmm. what all of our projects are we want to do right all of our wish list items and everything and then we just start knocking them out right what's the yeah. what's going to be the easiest what's a priority what's too expensive um his definition of a priority is a lot different than mine and you know i try to win as much as i can but when it yeah. comes to the man cave i i always lose um so <laughs> we try to we try to think about you know what do we want to have accomplished over the next year for this house yeah. because like i said we've been in it for six years and my kids are getting older it gets banged up more it gets used more um so you're going to want to factor that in um as well and thinking about the best way to do that and you know, from a planning standpoint, that's part of your conversations with your financial advisor, right? It's having the, hey, I want a deck. How do I, how can I afford a deck? Mm -hmm. Although right now it's very hard to pay for a deck oh, yeah. because of how expensive those prices are. Um, but all of those different things that you want to do, it's, it's best to plan for them for the major projects. Um, but there's always going to be some little things that you're going to want to do, um, some decor, some odds and mm -hmm. ends. So factoring that, factoring that into it. Um, those are the fun expenses. The yeah. boring expenses are, you know, utilities, homeowners association fee, condo fee, all those things that it's an expense and it's it's part of that property and, and mm -hmm. where you live um, and should all be considered when you're when you're purchasing a house. Um, I didn't really uh, hit on this, but on a homeowners association. For a lot of people, they don't want to move into a property or to a neighborhood that has a homeowners association fee because that means there's certain covenants that they have to abide by when mm -hmm. living in that community. You need to understand, um, you know, can I plant this bush? Can I build this deck? Um, there, some communities can be extremely restrictive. Um, in our last community, 
we got, a lot of neighbors got a notification because the homeowners association walked around the neighborhood and our grass was too long. It hadn't been cut. Well, truth be told, it hadn't been cut in a couple of weeks because we kept having rain. So we couldn't cut it. So then the grass grew. And then the one day we didn't, that's when they decided to do an audit. But you can get fined if you don't follow the rules of that HOA. So for some people, it can be um, it can be frustrating. But there can but there is also a fee associated with those mm -hmm. with those communities that have a homeowners association. Um, regarding utilities, you know what some sellers may do? They may show what the you what their past utility bills have been for the new buyer so that the buyer can factor that in to their upcoming expenses. Um, a lot of people these past few years have been getting into um, you know solar lights and everything on the roof or on the side. And it's really important to understand how those contracts work because for some companies, um, when you transfer the ownership of the solar lights over or solar panels over into the new buyer, the buyer may have to pay some fees. There could be a transfer cost that the seller is paying. There may be um, some debt still associated to it that the new buyer is responsible for. So mm -hmm. when we talk about inspections and everything, you get a separate inspection if you have solar panels. So understand everything that you are buying and all of the rules associated with it. And that's where, as you said, the real estate agent can be yeah. extremely knowledgeable and has that experience in dealing with a lot a lot of those. Um, but it's not just the, it's not just your mortgage payment, that's your expense. It's all these other mm -hmm. things that you really have to think about when you're purchasing a property. Um, it's almost like equating it to, I'm having a baby, now what? Uh, it's daycare expenses, it's diapers, it's camps, mm -hmm. it's college. A house is the same thing. I feel like Cody, with the transition on on the webinars we're doing, we have yeah. weddings, we have houses. I'm I'm thinking the marketing team is going to say, let's now look at. I'm ready to have a baby. Now what? So we can incorporate wow. all of those expenses, which will be, you know, shockingly similar to the same conversations. <laughs> shockingly similar, and I feel like we would have a lot of fun doing that one, and yeah. we'd be making some jokes towards my way. So I'd be uh, I'd have to get mentally ready for that. Of course, I also have a lot of good stories as well, which again, could probably take up a whole day and not just an hour. <laughs> oh, we got webinars coming in the future, so I'm sure that will be built in. But right. to put on your CFP cap a little bit, uh -huh. uh, I did see that one of the questions that came in that I think is extremely relevant right now is, you know, I have this idea of I'm ready and I want to buy this house. Sure. How, where should I be, where should I be saving that money? Should I have it in a money market account? Should I use possibly, you know, my IRA or my traditional IRA or my Roth IRA. Um, there's just so many avenues that people can use to fund it. But mm -hmm. I guess they were asking what would be the best for them. And yeah, that's a that's a great question. Um, you know, I actually just had this conversation with a client last week. My partner and I had a meeting with him. He had some excess money. We were talking about how we were going to invest this and everything. And he said, Well, I'd like to buy a property next year. And so we said, okay, time out. That changes the whole plan yeah. of recommendations. Because if you're going to be purchasing a property within the next couple of years, you want that money to be safe and you want it to be liquid. You don't want to put it into the stock market and then all of a sudden when you need it, half of it is there. Um, you also don't want to put it into something that's going to cause you taxes and penalties when you take it out. So you're going to have less money. So while interest rates aren't attractive and you're not going to get any growth on it, a savings account, a money market, a short-term CD, that's going to be your best avenue for saving, for just yeah. sheltering that, that money for, for the house. Um, unfortunately, there are ways you can access your retirement accounts mm -hmm. for a house purchase. Um, I advise against that because that's then taking away from those other goals and you would be paying taxes um, you may not have to pay a penalty depending on the type of account, but you would be paying taxes. You could take a loan from your 401k. Again, I would advise against that because it's taking money out of the market for you. It's going to take you longer to catch up because you have to rebuild um, those savings and everything. But um, again, those options are all out there. But I would say rule of thumb, best practices, keep it in a savings account, money market, short term CD something safe, something liquid, something that's not going to cause taxes or penalty when you need that money for the down payment, you know, within the next one to two years.
No, I think that absolutely answers that question. And we've kind of rolled through a lot, and I know we definitely have some more questions. So I think we open it up, and we have Sarah, our marketing director, uh, who I believe is on the line, who can chime in with some of those questions that she has saved throughout the presentation. But right. I definitely wanted to make sure we had some time at the end to address these because this conversation can go a lot of different directions. So we definitely did the the broad overview. So Sarah, are you there? I am here. Welcome, I do welcome. notice you called Lee Knight one of your favorites and I was just marketing director, but that's no, okay. She, she was waiting for that. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Uh, we did have a question, um, someone local actually, um, there is uh, someone in Columbia, Maryland, they've okay. submitted four offers and have been outbid despite $30,000 over the asking price. Everyone right now knows this market is absolutely insane. Do you have any advice for just buyers in this crazy market? I mean, should they wait? Should they just keep putting offers in? What would you guys advise they do? Uh, great question. And, and you know, my my first house was also in the Columbia area. It was when real estate was going through a boom and we did the same thing. We put in contract after contract. We had the escalation clause. Um, we knew at that point in time that we were more than likely going to be overpaying for that property. Mm -hmm. um, we were in a financial position though, where we were ready to purchase a house and financially we could afford to go over a little bit if we needed to. Um, so my answer to that person would be, look to see what your max limit is, right? There's going to be a point to where you can't go more than $30,000 over. So at some point you're going to get priced out. Um, Unfortunately, it's just the way the market is right now. If now is the time where you're ready to move and to take that step, then I would encourage you to just keep looking around. Um, you know, I don't want to kind of come across where everything happens for a reason, but I can assure you that the house that you eventually find will have been worth the wait. Now, the other way that you could look at it is say, well, I'm going to wait until the real estate market cools down a little bit. Um, the risk that you have with that is that interest rates are going to go up. So what you could qualify for now may be a lot different than what you can qualify for down the road. So I would encourage you to continue to be patient, um, continue to look, and uh, you know that's something that your real estate agent and you can kind of focus on on what makes mm -hmm. the most sense. But this is very normal and common when we go through uh, these types of uh, you know spikes. Yeah. Awesome, thank you. Um, we do have another question that is pretty similar. You touched on it a little bit, but Maybe you can go into it a little more. Assuming that rates are at or near an all-time low and will likely increase, is it worth it to purchase now despite the inflated prices and bidding wars or wait until um, the market cools down? Yeah, again, the, the risk that you have is purely interest rate risk at that point. So if interest rates are going to start to creep up, that's going to mean that your mortgage payment gets higher which means that your debt to income ratio changes. So what you can, what you originally qualified for, you may no longer be able to qualify for. So what I would advise is go through the numbers to see where you're at from a qualification standpoint, and then look to see where's your break even for where interest rates have to be to be able to hit that same price point. And that's something that your lender, your agent, your financial advisor can all run those numbers um, so that if rates jump, you know, to a 30 year mortgage that's at four and a half percent, all of a sudden, um, you want to be able to make sure that you can jump on that as well, uh, as far as where you're supposed to qualify from a house. I, I would say continue to look at properties now because interest rates are low. It's going to keep your payment low for the long term. So the, the alternative on waiting and getting a higher interest rate is you could say, well, I'll just refinance down the road. That's not a problem. We'll just, we'll refinance. So much can change over the next few years. Your financial world can change. The rules of refinancing can change, which we've already seen happen over the past few years. Mm -hmm. We had one bank that just stopped refinances altogether. Actually, a couple banks that stopped refinances altogether because they were swamped with um, new purchases and everything else. So it is risky to say, I can just refinance down the road, but it is, it is an option. And so you wanna make sure that the loan that you're taking now gives you some flexibility for refinancing. If you decide, 
I'm just going to do what's called an interest only loan, or I'm going to do a five year arm, um, which means that in five years, your interest rate adjusts and you think in those five years, you'll be able to um, uh, refinance and get a lower interest rate. Again, we don't know how high these interest rates are going in the next few years. So it's a risk that you're going to take. Um, I would say it's worth starting to, it's worth continuing to buy now with the lower interest rates, but know where your pressure points are. Know how high you can go up when you start putting offers in. Um, and that again, it, that comes back to the pre-approval. It comes back to looking at your own financial situation. And if you plan on being there in, you know, for seven to 10 years, you'll recoup what was overpaid. That equity yeah. through improvements that you do, through you know, um, continuing your mortgage payments, you'll recoup that equity. Sarah, you Thank got you. a couple more? Oh, I do. Yeah, I'm sure. I knew this would be a uh, popular topic that everyone had questions about. Oh yeah. Um, can, someone wants to talk about just the types of mortgages. If you're only able to qualify for say an FHA loan, is that something you should go for or wait until you qualify for a conventional? Are there pros and cons to the different types and just kind of what do you guys have to say about those types of loans? Yeah, um, so it's a, it's a very common question because there's uh, a ton of different loan options yeah. available and the lender is going to work with the buyer on what is suitable for them, what they qualify for because different types of loans require different down payments. It can be based mm -hmm. upon your credit score, the closing costs are different, the flexibility of the loan is going to be different. Um, so many, many years ago, it was a 15-year or a 30-year mortgage. Now there's interest-only loans, there's jumbo loans, there's loans with arms, there's seven-year arm, five-year arm, et cetera. There's so many choices. Um, and so it's important to understand what you qualify for. For some, you may only be approved for FHA and you can't do anything else. And so that limits your scope. For others, they have to qualify for a jumbo loan. And um, you know, one of my partners, when he was building a house, um, qualified for the jumbo loan. And then guess what? They changed the rules on him and that bank no longer offered jumbo loans. So you then had to kind of find another lender who was going to be able to offer that type of loan because at certain price points, you need certain types of loans. So you want to make sure that you understand the risks associated with all the varying loans out there. Um, for some individuals, the lender may customize the type of loan they're looking at because they want to afford a certain amount of, you know, the payment needs to be at a certain level. So they're going to look at um, different types of loans and that's where an interest only or an arm may come into, uh, may come into play. Uh, arms are very popular for short-term needs. So if it's an investment property, they may end up utilizing just an arm versus kind of a traditional 30-year note. Um, for a lot of uh, individuals who are getting close to retiring, they want to get that mortgage paid off quicker. So they may look at a shorter time period. So um, again, kind of coming back to the good old fashioned, it depends. Mm -hmm. um, it, it truly does. You, you want to make sure that you're making the right decision because at some point, if you decide to refinance, guess what? You're going to be paying those costs again. So you want to make sure if you're paying those costs again to refinance, to get out of one loan, to get into another, um, that it's worth that it's worth the uh, the cost, the expense in, in going through that. So um, a lot of the mortgages though can have different type of risk um, depending on what you're getting. So like I said, interest rate risk right now is huge. So if you can lock in a 30 year loan at a extremely low rate right now, that's ideally what you wanna do. Um, if you can't afford the payment, that the lender is uh, recommending and you have some flexibility with cash flow, one option that you have is you can actually buy down the rate. So buying down the rate is what's called points. So you can pay a certain amount of points and buy down that rate, which will help you lower your mortgage payment. And for certain individuals, they can actually deduct those points off of their tax return. There's certain rules that they'd have to qualify for, but um, that would be an option too, if it would make sense to pay a few thousand dollars to buy down that rate. And again, that's where you can kind of go through the financial numbers and looking at a break even. Awesome. Uh, I think we do have time for another question or two. Um, 
someone wants to know, is there a benefit to renting over buying? Is, is there a reason someone should avoid buy, buying a house and just stick to renting a house or renting an apartment? Um, you know, I look at it from a headache standpoint and also from a cash flow standpoint. So, um, you know, I have clients that have been renting for over 20 years because um, and and they're older, um, they're single, um, they don't want to deal with, you know, landscaping or condo fees or maintenance issues and all of those uh, other expenses that Cody and I talked about. Mm -hmm. So for them, it, it's honestly, it's a comfort decision on renting over buying. Financially, um, I think we can all say financially, there's benefits of buying over renting for the long term when you think about mm -hmm. how much you're going to be spending in rent over 10 years versus if you just put it into an investment property. So uh, I'd say that really comes down to comfort decision on what you want. You know, my, my husband and I, we joke a lot about how life was so much easier when we had a one bedroom apartment um, versus now um, there's just, there's more to take care of. And I think you get to a certain point in your life where does it make sense to do that or not? For younger individuals coming right out of college, um, they're not in a hurry to purchase a property. They're fine renting. Um, there's the social aspect of it, of having different people in their apartment. They can go wherever they want, move to different cities and everything. Um, there's content in staying at home with the parents for a few years while you're building up your savings as well. Mm -hmm. um, so again, there's no financial benefit, I would say, renting over buying in the long term. That's really going to be a comfort decision. And, you know, just to kind of add to that a little bit, when thinking about retirees, for some people, for some retirees, they they sell their primary house um, and they don't know where they want to go, but the market was hot. So they decided to sell it. They pocketed that cash. They may rent for a few years. Um, they may let that money grow, help it with retirement income and everything until they find where their next stage is going to be. Um, so for retirees, we're starting to see more of an influx in the rental market for those retirees because they've they've sold that home that they've been in for 20 or 30 years, made significant amount. They were able to reinvest some of that money to help to generate some retirement income for them. Um, and then in the few years, they'll, they'll figure out where they want to go and make sure that that money is set aside for a down payment. Sarah, I think we got time for one more quick one if you got one ready. All right, I'm just going through the list, trying to pick <laughs> the best final question that we can get. Um, this might be something more real estate agent question, but I want to see if you guys can take a stab at it. Um, first time home buyers, different counties usually have different uh, incentives for first time home buyers. Is there anything you guys can share about um, different incentives and things that you should look for if you're a first time home buyer? Mm -hmm. Um, so, yeah, for first time home buyers, there can be incentives both within the counties, there can be incentives with the lenders as well. Um, the issue with first time home buyers can also be um, making sure that they have the credit and the assets to be able to purchase what they need. Um, but if you are, um, let's say you're building a property, there can be a lot of incentives on building a property versus um, uh, versus buying an existing property, regardless if you're a first-time home buyer or not. Um, so I would look at, again, in looking at the incentives and, and trying to keep the answer pretty pretty short, I would look at incentives that are going to maximize um, you know, your financial situation, right? Am I going to get a, a large tax break? Am I going to get a reduction in my um, mortgage payment? And I would take reduction in mortgage payment over tax break because that mortgage payment is going to be longer term versus the tax break that's gonna be one and done. Um, but for first time home buyers, the, the challenge can be with them is making sure that they have the, you know, the credit that's needed, um, that they have the income stability um, and that they can make that down payment as well. Yeah, I, Lena, thank you. Just answered everything that was asked of you and more. Great. So I really appreciate you coming on. But before uh, we get your little outro, um, as everyone can see on the screen right now, we have next steps. And there's actually a barcode in the little house over here. 
that if you take a picture with your phone, you can set up a free consultation that, uh, that I touched on when we began with one of our advisors at BFG. And this is a completely free consultation uh, to maybe answer some of the questions that you sent in that we weren't able to address. And if you're viewing this webinar via your phone, uh, if you just respond with your questions or if you would like to set up a consultation, you can just respond right to that email and then we'll reach out to you. Uh, other than that, Lena, thank you so much. It was great to have you back. It was so great that we're actually gonna have you back next month, uh, August 11th. And our next topic is gonna be on creative strategies to pay off student loans and debt, which I think there are gonna be a lot of people who are interested in that topic. Um, and like I said, it's just been a joy to have you on. So uh, I'm gonna keep bringing you back for as long as I can. Sounds good, Cody. Thanks so much, I appreciate it. No problem. I hope you have a great day. And thank you again for everyone listening in. Uh, if this is on a recording, thank you for tuning in. And if you watch live, thank you. Uh, we'll see you guys next month. Bye.